Shalom, shalom. Welcome, welcome, world changers. Yes, tonight we are starting with uh, the Pauline epistles, as they call it. The Pauline epistles, the letters of Paul. So we're going to start with 1 Thessalonians tonight. Yeah, um, you know what? I think I'm a little bit louder than I am usual here. Uh, let me just turn my volume down a little bit. Um, don't want to blow you guys. Uh, all right. So, um, yes, we're going to start with 1 Thessalonians. And that is because um, most scholars believe that 1 Thessalonians, excuse me, um, was the first letter uh, of Paul. Some believe it was Galatians, but uh, for the most part, uh, most scholars believe that it was 1 Thessalonians. So, because of that, we're going to read 1 Thessalonians first. And so I think it's very important to, uh, to really read these letters and to read every book of the New Testament in the in the order that they were written. It helps, you know, it really helps to, uh, to grasp the chronological progression of the, you know, theology and of the writings of the New Testament. A lot of people believe that uh, Matthew was written first just because it is first. No, it wasn't. No. Uh, it was First Thessalonians, or like I said, some scholars believe it's Galatians, but we're going to go with First Thessalonians tonight. So, welcome, 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 everyone. Good to see you in the chat. Let's see what we have here. We have Psalm 94 says, Shalom, everyone. Calamento says, Shalom, everyone. Billy says, Shalom. Vinny says, Shalom, everyone. Tammy says, Shalom, all. And Freedom... The Freedom Forum Network gives me an elbow bump. Good to see you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. All right. So, um, let me see here. Corey says, I wanted to plan a, a vacation with an old school pianist, but we were too baroque. Shalom, everyone. Shalom, Corey. Good to see you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. You know what? Uh, sometimes it's not good to be quote unquote normal when normal is is not normal. If you know what I mean. Uh, so hey, you know what? Praise God. Uh, I mean, all of uh, you know every serious uh, student of Scripture and every serious um, uh, believer and those who have a, a an authentic relationship with God. We all have to pay. Sometimes it's because, well, I mean, it's not that we have to pay really. It's actually that, you know, it's, it's the ones who reject us. They're the ones that are actually losing, right? They're the ones that are actually losing out, but uh, it's a sad situation anyway. In, in, in a lot of cases, some people, they have to uh, completely, you know, uh, it costs them all of their friends, all of their family, everything. And so, but, you know, um, in the end, it is worth it. It is worth it. So welcome, welcome, everyone. We are going to get into this First Thessalonians. Now, uh, just before, uh, again, a little bit of a background. Um, and just to let guys, let, just to let you guys know as well, we're going to go for, we're going to go through First Thessalonians word for word. Uh, some of you know that I posted a poll there uh, yesterday. And uh, asked you guys uh, for some input on this. And uh, yeah, I've decided to go through it word for word um, as popular demand. Um, and you know what? I think it's I think it's best that we do that because uh, there's so much to talk about and uh, we don't want to miss. We don't want to uh, leave one stone overturned un unturned. Uh, well, you know what I'm talking about. One stone that's not uh, turned. Okay, we want to we want to deal with everything. So right off the bat, um, before I start talking about th uh, First Thessalonians specifically, I think it's important to understand that most scholars um, agree that of the thirteen epistles of Paul. I kind of hate the word use the word epistle because it's another one of those, you know, like transliterated words that makes it sound special. It's really the word epistle simply means letter. Okay. 
Paul just sat down with his quill and wrote a letter. That's basically what happened. Uh, and I got here my own little quill. So, I mean, hey, he just sat down with his quill and he wrote personal letters. You know, these letters uh, that Paul wrote were personal letters. Uh, Tim, uh, uh, Thessalonians was, you can, you can tell it's got a little bit more of a personal tone in it than some of the other letters that he wrote. Now, there are 13 of Paul's letters that are included in the New Testament. Out of the 13, most scholars uh, agree that only seven, that's, you know, just a little bit more than half uh, of the of the 13 letters attributed to Paul are actually authentic. Um. They believe that the other six are not authentic. They are, well, for lack of a better term, they are forged in the name of Paul. Uh, apparently, there, it was uh, quite the uh, practice back in those days, you know, for other, for, you know, no-name people, so to speak, uh, to sit down and write a letter uh in the name of somebody else. Just thinking, well, what would Paul say if I, you know, if I were Paul, what would I say? And just write a letter, you know, in that regard. Uh, so it's important to understand that. Um, there are many different reasons for that, but uh, I mean, for that uh, conclusion, um, I've got some different theories myself on that, but there are uh, differences in tone, in writing style, in many ways between the earlier letters of Paul and the later letters that are attributed to Paul. Okay, let me put it that way. If you think about it, if you study, if you sit down and you study stuff like Galatians and First Thess Thessalonians here, and you know some of the earlier letters that are attributed to Paul, like First and Second Corinthians, you study those Romans. Okay. Um, and compare it with uh, First and Second Timothy. Compare it with, you know, Titus. It's quite a bit different. Quite a bit different. The tone, the content, you know, the feel, everything. It's it's quite a bit different. Um. By the way, the the seven letters that most scholars attribute to uh, Paul as being authentic are Galatians, 1 Thessalonians, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Romans, Philippians, and Philemon. Or Philemon. Philemon. Um, so that's Galatians, 1 Thessalonians, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Romans, Philippians, and Philemon. Those are the ones that most scholars say they are authentic. They were they they were the authentic letters of Paul. The other ones, the other six, are debatable. So, uh, having said that, this letter that we are reading is uh, one of the authentic letters of Paul that most scholars would say are uh, is authentic. It's very interesting as well. Now, one of the, oh, actually the, um, uh, the earliest uh what do I say? The earliest uh, records that we have of anybody uh, compiling a, a bunch of Paul's letters together and uh, calling it the New Testament is that from uh, Marcion or Martian. Uh, and Martian had his own canon. Uh, Martian didn't have a very good reputation, uh, but he did have a uh, his own canon. In other words, he had uh, his own list of books that he included in his um, in his New Testament, and uh, some of the most of the authentic letters of Paul are actually uh, part of that Marcionite canon. Uh, Marcion's canon included Galatians, First Corinthians, Second Corinthians, Romans, First Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians. Laodiceans, by the way, that's another uh, letter, epistle, that is attributed to Paul. Um, 
Perhaps Lord willing, we'll get into that uh, at, a, at a later date. Colossians, Philemon, and Philippians. Okay, so those were the uh, the letters, the epistles of Paul that Marcion uh, compiled together with uh, his version of the of the Gospel of Luke, and he called it the New Testament, basically. So that's basically the, the first New Testament. For those of you who are not aware of this, Marcion was a, uh, was not a very, um, he was not a very good man. Okay. Um, without saying a whole lot, uh, he, he was, he was, uh, he, he was attributed as being a very evil man. Let's just put it that way by, by many of the early church fathers and denied as a heretic. Um, interesting that Marcion would be, and he was a self-proclaimed disciple of Paul. Um, whereas someone like Justin Martyr, one of the early church fathers, Justin Martyr, uh, he did not mention Paul at all, any of Paul's writings. He did not quote any of Paul's writings at all in any of his uh, writings and Ju Justin Martyr wrote like uh, if you if you check out the Antonician uh, Fathers I believe it's Antonician Fathers volumes and uh, there was like four hundred pages of uh, writings from the early Church Father Justin Martyr back way back you know in the second century and um, he didn't mention Paul at all. Can you imagine? Can you just imagine? A Christian leader today, a church leader today, writing a book some 400 pages long without ever mentioning Paul or quoting Paul's uh, writings. I mean, today we can hardly get through a short little clip, video clip from a Christian without them quoting one of the letters of Paul. So uh, that's a very interesting concept as well. So Paul um, is controversial in that sense. Uh, we have um, we have the Ebionites, the early uh, Christian uh, sect, I guess you would call it, of the Ebionites, who uh, basically rejected Paul's writings, and um, and there were other uh, groups as well that rejected Paul's writings for various reasons. Uh, however, because of Marcion, we got uh, Paul uh, made his way into the New Testament. And uh, throughout the uh, following uh, three, four centuries, uh, it was, uh, what would you say, tweaked and um, edited into what we have, uh, the 27 books in the New Testament today. So, um, First Thessalonians is interesting in the sense that it doesn't really have a whole lot of the uh, theology in it. Like, it doesn't say much about being saved by faith alone or, you know, it doesn't say much about the law, you know, how you would you would read in the in the book of Galatians or Romans or, you know, Corinthians. It doesn't say much about that at all. Um, it's really kind of a uh, moderate letter, if I can put it that way, of uh, from uh, from Paul. And so. Interesting in its uh, in its composition, and uh, so we will get through that as uh, as the Lord leads here. Uh, let me just see here what we have in the live chat just before I dive in. Yeah, Corey says when we are with God, we tend to lose a lot of things. Well, you know, we, lo we lose the things that we don't need, <laughs> really. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, don't take it in a bad way, but I mean, you know what? I I, I hear of people say, you know what? I, you know, since I become a Christian, I lost like 400 friends. I lost, I lost like you know 5,000 followers, whatever. I say you didn't lose 5,000 followers. You lost 5,000 enemies. <laughs> okay, you didn't lose 5,000 friends. You lost 5,000 enemies. Yes, Vinny says it's all gain with God. Uh, we only lose worldly things. It's true. Philemon, Philemon. Yeah. Corey asked the question, why was the, ma the majority of the New Testament written in Greek? Would it be canonical if 
we were to stick to the original language. So uh, the Greek language came um, into popularity through Alexander the Great back in those, uh, back a few hundred, how many hundred years BC, when Alexander the Great came into power. Uh, And so he is the one who really just established Greek as the main, the primary language in that area of the world, all the way from Alexandria, all the way, you know, around that, that region. Uh, And so because of that, like Greek was like, it was, it's like English today in the world, right? Especially in the Western world, um, where you have, uh, you know, English is, is the thing. People can talk, you know, speak other languages, especially if they come from different countries or they have, you know, they may have uh, another language as their mother tongue. But in the, you know, in the West, English, you have to, they should read or write English for sure. Uh, and so that's the way it was back in those days in in that area of the world. I mean, it, you know, they say that they most likely spoke, let's say, um, um, Aramaic or, you know, Hebrew in this sense, but Greek was still the the standard for reading and writing for like literary works. And so because of that, they wrote it in Greek. Like, you know, back in those days, it's like, well, why write it in a minor, in a, in a language that is mi- like a minority language that a lot of people don't know? Why not write it in a language that a lot of people, you know, because that's really the, the whole, uh, the purpose of of writing something down is to communicate. So Greek is, you know, Greek was the uh, language to communicate back in those days. So that's why the authors of the of the New Testament decided to write in Greek. Same with uh, the Apocrypha as well. Um, again, influenced by Alexander the Great and uh, you know some of the political. Uh, powers in that area that really pushed Greek as uh, the standard uh, for communicating. Um, I don't think that, that that really makes a difference in regards to its inspiration or non-inspiration, you know, whether it's the word of God or not the word of God. You know, some people say, a lot of Christians would say, well, the Apocrypha is not, I've, I've heard this before, the Apocrypha is not the word of God because, it, because it's in Greek. It's like, the New Testament's in Greek. Have you ever thought of that? <laughs> um, yeah, You know what? God is not confined. He's not boxed into any one language. I know there's a different excuse me, there's different religions who have their own language and this kind of thing. I would tend to say that God uses many different languages um, to communicate his word. Uh, It is important to go, if we have a document that is originally written in a certain language and it's translated into another one, it is important to go back to the original, um, you know, whenever we we have that original. but beside that, uh, you know, I think that uh, language is just a tool. It's just a tool uh, that uh, that God uses. Thank you, Corey, for that question. Very good. Okay, so um, let's do this. This is First Thessalonians chapter one, verse one. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church in. Or to the church of the Thessalonians in God, the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from our God, our from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So, first off, um, Paul identifies he's the one who's speaking. Silvanus also was in there, and Timothy is also in there as well. Notice it doesn't say this. Now, whenever, let me just say this. Let me just back up a step. Whenever we're reading any scripture, any, actually any book, be it scripture, non-scripture, or Bible, extra biblical books, whatever the case, we need to ask, who wrote this? What did they say? What did they not say? And who is the audience? And what is the cultural context? I mean, all of these things make a huge difference. 
Notice what it says. It's Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church in Thessalonica, or to the church of the Thessalonians in God, you know, yada, yada, yada. So Paul did not write this to the world. Um, Paul wrote this to just a handful of people. Uh, the word church here, ecclesia, means to those who are called out. Now, we don't know how many people. We don't know if there were two. It could have been two. could have been 20. We don't know. Could have been 200. Okay, I doubt it'd be that many, but um, the word ecclesia that's translated church here is from the Greek words ek and kaleo. Ek means out, kaleo means call. Actually, it's 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 kind of related to our word call, call leo, call, call at call out. So um this book, it's very clear. It's Paul who wrote, Paul, Savannah, and Timothy, who wrote to the chosen ones, at least what what they determined as the people who were chosen, those who were called out, those who were called to be, and you say, what does that mean, called out? Called out, meaning that you are called to be set apart for God. You are holy. You are dedicated to God. You're not like the rest of the world. You don't think like the rest of the world. You don't live like the rest of the world. You are set apart. You are called out. And by the way, you know that word ecclesia that's translated church here is all, was also used back in those days uh, in around the same time in history to refer to the synagogues too. This is one thing that a lot of Christians don't realize. The people who attended synagogues were also called, it was also called the ecclesia. The people who were called out. People who were called out from the world system. The people who were called out to live holy lives. To live dedicated to God. Consecrated to God. So, it is a personal letter from Paul, Savannah, and Timothy to some people, a few people, in Thessalonica. That's what it says. It does not say, thus saith the Lord. It does not say, thus saith the Lord. It does not say, the Lord, the God of Israel, to the believers. And But that's the way a lot of Christians read it. That's the way they read it. They they read Thess, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 1 and their and their eyes gloss over because they don't I mean it's like first of all this is not really written to you. Just because it's not written to us doesn't mean we should throw it away. Don't get me wrong. I'm not just because it's not written for us, it's not really for us. Uh it doesn't mean that we can't learn from it. Sure we can learn from it. There's lots of things we can learn from that people who wrote a letter to I mean, you can take a book that's not even for you, not even written for you at all. And you weren't even in the mind of the author and you can still learn from that book. But it's important to understand that book was not written for you. And so it's important for us to understand none of the letters of Paul, none of the epistles of Paul were written for us. They were written for a specific people in a specific time in a specific place. And that makes a lot of difference as well because cultural context comes into play. It, it can make all the difference. Words that meant something just 50 years ago can mean something completely different today. Words that meant something 2,000 years ago can mean something way different today, especially in a different culture. So we have to keep that in mind. Paul, Savannah, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is this is Paul writing to people he probably met on his journeys in Thessalonica. Now remember, in the context that I mean, chron chronologically speaking, they didn't, these people did not have the gospels. They didn't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay. They didn't have these gospels. Paul just is writing to these people, and these people don't really the only scriptures they have 
is the Tanakh. A lot of people quote say, well, don't ever say that Paul, what Paul wrote isn't scripture because he said, you know, 2 Thessalonians or 2 Timothy, I should say, 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of, of, of God. Okay, that's what Paul said to Timothy. If you actually believe that he wrote that because most scholars believe that he didn't write that to Timothy. Most scholars believe it was a fabrication in the name of Paul wasn't really Paul that wrote that, wasn't authentic. However, let's just say it was for the sake of argument. First of all, he's writing to Timothy, not to us. Second of all, when he said scripture, he's not talking about his letter. When, when he sits down with a parchment and he's writing, his, he's talking, oh, let me let me think, what am I going to say to Timothy, my, my, my son in the Lord, my brother in the Lord? What am I going to say to him? I met him the other day. You know, and I just, uh, I want to make sure that he, I want to make sure he knows that all scripture, I just want to kind of, Im, you know, impress this on him. The scripture is given by the inspiration of God, profitable for instruction and in righteousness. Yeah, I'll just write that down. So don't ask the question, what does scripture mean to you? Ask the question, what does scripture mean to him, to Paul? What does scripture mean to Timothy? Certainly wasn't Paul's letters. They were just personal letters he got from a buddy that he met. Ah. Oh, yeah, Paul. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, mean, yeah I know Paul. Yeah, well, you, I get, you got a letter in the mail today from Paul. Okay, open up. Yeah, okay. Well, scripture. Yeah, Scripture was the Tanakh back in those days. The letters of Paul were not even deemed to be Scripture until much, much later than that. 1 Thessalonians 1, 2. We give thanks to God always. For you all, making mention of you in our prayers. So again, Paul is speaking on behalf of the other his other two buddies there. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patient of uh, of of excuse me, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. Okay, again, this is pretty clear. Paul is not talking to me or you, he's talking to people he knew that that were working uh, without ceasing, uh, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, patience of hope in the Lord, in our Lord Jesus Christ, okay? Verse 5, for our gospel, our gospel? Hmm. It's interesting here, it says our gospel as opposed to what we read there the other night where it's like the Lord's gospel. Like in in uh, uh, the Gospel of Thomas, the Lord's Gospel, okay, or the Didache, you know, talking about the Lord's Gospel. But Paul claims it's hit or our Gospel, meaning Paul, Timothy, and Silvanus. For our Gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and the Holy Spirit, and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. As you know, what kind of men we were among you for your sake. So what does this mean? Uh, in other words, he wasn't, he, he's basically saying, uh, we, we, we are not just boring preachers that just preach, you know, words, but we actually have, uh, demonst we actually, uh, have demonstration. We have action here. We have power and in the Holy Spirit, uh, assuming that this means like, um, Working miracles. Um, no, this doesn't necessarily mean speaking in tongues. It's working miracles and uh, uh, it's basically like, almost like prophesying. Okay, verse six. And you became followers of us and of the Lord. Having received the word in much affliction with joy, with joy of the Holy Spirit so that you became examples to all Macedonia and Achaia who believe. All right. So this reminds me, having received the word in much affliction reminds me of in the book of Acts where it talks about uh, this kind of concept. Um, I wonder if it has it here in the cross references. Uh, the book of Acts. I don't believe so. Um, 
so in the book of Acts, it talks about receiving well, without, let me just, um, hardship or much, much affliction. We'll try hardship here. Affliction. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of the exact wording of this. Um, I think you guys know what I'm talking about, uh, where it says in the book of Acts that we must ha we must um, attain to the kingdom of God through much affliction, something like that. Let me just, just see here. Tribulation, that's what I'm looking for. Acts chapter 14, verse 22. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith that we must, through much tribulation, through, uh, we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. We must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Similar to what Paul says here, uh, to his, again, to his buddies in Thessalonica, you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you become, became uh, examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. You know, this is interesting. Vinny, I just saw this here. Uh, Paul also separates God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ as talking about two people. He didn't say Jesus, our God, our Father, as opposed uh, opposed to the Trinity belief. Very interesting. It's a good point. Thank you for pointing that out, uh, Vinny. Verse 8. For from you, the word of the Lord has sounded forth. Now, this is interesting because what's, what's Paul talking about here? Apparently, the believers, uh, the brothers or whoever he was writing to um, were preachers, evangelists of some sort. Um, as he wrote here, for from you, the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of free we had to you and how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Now, so this is something here to... Um, worthy of noting in first Thessalonians. Now, let me just, let me just, uh, okay. So in first Thessalonians, as this is one of his earliest, if not the earliest of, of Paul's letters, he seems to be very convinced that Jesus will appear at any time. Like you, like he's coming right now. Like he's coming soon, very soon. And we'll see a little bit later here that Paul himself d believed that Jesus would come back in his lifetime. Okay. We'll we'll get to that. We'll get to that. And, and another note, uh, side note here is in the later uh letters in Paul's later letters he seems to abandon he kind of abandoned that idea and it makes you wonder why maybe he's like well maybe he's not coming when i thought he would maybe jesus is not coming if you notice this in thessalonians he's like right on it he's like right on it jesus is coming any moment you know and i can get i'll, I'll get to this in just a, just a, 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 just a little bit but he he, you know, explicitly expressed his belief that Jesus would appear, uh, come back a second time in his lifetime. 
1 Thessalonians chapter 2, for you yourselves know, and by the way, uh, I like to point this out every once in a while, that uh, these letters, these epistles were not written originally in chapters and verses, okay? Uh, chapters and verses were added later by the scribes and the, you know, the Bible publishers later. It was just all one long uh, flowing letter here in Paul. Paul didn't write it, say, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. So really, I mean, on like chapters are not really biblical, I mean, scriptural anyway. They're not really original. Um, they are uh, added in there later. Nevertheless, um, as we have it, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, for you yourselves know, brethren, now again, keep in mind, Paul's talking to, the, to his buddies in Thessalonica right now, that our coming to you was not in vain. So, who, again, our Paul, Silvanus, Timothy, our coming to you is not, was not in vain. But even after we had suffered before and were sp spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much, of, in much conflict. For our exal, uh, exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is our witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, just as a nurse and mother cherishes his, her own children. So affectionately longing for you, we were, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God. Now he's talking about gospel of God, not his gospel. You know, I mean, lit, literally speaking, but also our, our own lives because you had become dear to us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil. Now, again, um, see, I was I was brought up to always read the Bible as if it's God speaking to me directly. Or if it's God speaking through Paul to us directly. But, I mean, the reality is, God, I mean, Paul did not even claim that God speaking through him. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that everything that he said is wrong. I'm just saying that he didn't claim it. He didn't, he wasn't like uh, Moses or, you know, David or Isaiah or, you know, Jeremiah saying, thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord. No, he's talking like a brother because that's, that was the context here. He's not like, this is what God says. He's like, oh, I'm just talking to you as a brother. You remember, brothers, you remember, you guys in Thessalonica, the guys that, that I met, and, yeah, I know you guys, uh, you remember us, right? You, you remember our labor and toil for laboring night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. As you know, how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children, that you should walk worthy of God who calls you into his own glory, or kingdom and glory. Well, so far, so good. Sounds good, Paul. Uh, verse 13, for this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. Okay, so... According to this, okay, so according to this, uh, 
he preached, he did here claim to preach the word of God. Now it says that you received the word of God, meaning that it was uh, it already preached. Now again, this if this is a, you know the the first letter, as most scholars believe, this is like the oldest letter of um, of the New Testament. Then there's a lot of stuff that's been preached here that we don't know about. Okay, so. For you, brothers, you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God, which are in Judea in Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the, th the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans, who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted and persecuted us, and they do not please God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. So this particular rant here that Paul goes on is certainly uh, not very... <laughs> not very nice, okay? I'll put it that way. It's not very nice um, in, in regards to our uh, Jewish brothers and sisters. Moving on, Second, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17. But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. Again, you see, this is quite personal. This is not you know, um, God speaking directly to us. This is Paul speaking to them. Therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and time again, but Satan hindered us. Satan hindered us. Interesting. Now, think about this. How could you ever hear Jesus saying something like this? Well, I wanted to come to you guys, but Satan stopped me. I'm just, I'm just, I mean, just a thought, just a thought. Have you ever heard, you know, could you ever imagine Jesus saying something like that? For what, or God, for that matter, for what, yeah, there's a good point right there. I mean, that if this is God speaking, then, I mean, you, no, it can't be. I mean, Satan can't hinder God. For what? is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing. It is not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. Or is it not even you in the, in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? So again, he's talking about the coming of the Lord. Okay, so he's, he's pumped. He's expecting the coming of the Lord very, very shortly. We see that in chapter 1. We see that in chapter 2. We'll see that again very shortly. For, uh, for you are our glory and joy. Chapter 3. Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone and sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith so that no one should be taken by these afflictions for you yourselves know that we are appointed to this appointed to affliction you won't hear this from the uh you know from jo uh, joel osteen um for in fact we told you before when we were when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation just as it happened, and you know. For this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you, and our labor might be in vain. But now that Timothy has come to us from you, and see, so there's a background here. Right? Again, Paul, it's pretty, it's pretty personal. There's a background here. There's a background picture going on. 
stuff that we don't know. Uh, he didn't say much about. You just got to basically have to fill in the blanks here. Now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news of your faith and love and that you always have good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, in all our affliction and distress, we were comforted concerning you by your faith. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. This is interesting. This is interesting here. Because this here, uh, this is... uh, against the OSAS doctrine, once saved, always saved. Uh, this word live, in, of course, is talking about salvation, i.e. the just shall live by faith. Talking about salvation. For now, basically, we're saved. If, there's a big if in the middle of this sentence here, if, there's a condition, if you stand fast in the Lord. It's not like Paul said, like how a lot of Christians say today, oh, you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, therefore you're good. Don't worry about it. It's all under it's all under the uh, you know, all under the rug, so to speak. You're covered, okay? He didn't say that. He said, You will live if there's that condition, if you stand fast in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God for you for all the joy with which we rejoice? For your sake, before our God, night and day, praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father Himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct you, or direct our way to you, excuse me. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you so that he may establish your hearts blameless. Okay, I like that. I mean, here's Paul, uh, you know, the the apostle that most people use to try to cover up their, their sin. Well, you know, it's by grace we're saved. You know, it's okay, you sin. I mean, look at what Paul said here. Blameless. That's the idea. You may establish your hearts blameless and holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord. Again, 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 the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Now, see, this is one of the reasons why they believe this is one of the earlier letters. I mean, it was kind of like hot off the press, so to speak, even though it was still, what, some 15 years, 15, 20 years after the fact. Okay, after Jesus died, you know, the whole the whole thing. So after Jesus walked the earth in the flesh, so to speak, some 15, 20 years later, I, this is like one of the first New Testament texts that pop up. And you can see they're they're like they're really earnestly looking like, okay, so it's been a, you know, it's been like a decade here, but I mean Jesus is coming soon. Like he's coming soon. He says that in chapter one, he says that in chapter two, he says that in chapter three. Watch what he says in chapter 4. Chapter 4. Finally then, brethren, we urge you, uh, urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God. Again, this is good stuff. Um, this is not just saved by grace alone. This is, you know, you ought to walk and you ought to live holy, basically. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus Christ. So what commandments would this be? Of course, it would have to be Torah. Can't be anything but that. Remember, Paul was a Jew. Some even call him rabbi. Rav, Rav Shu, Shu, um, Shaul. Rav Shaul. Meaning Rav, Paul the uh, Saul, uh, Rabbi Saul, basically. Uh, and Jesus was a rabbi, right? And so... Back in those days and today, I mean, you got uh, uh, Orthodox rabbis per se. They're not going to be going around teaching some other commandments. It's going to be Torah. Everything, everything that Jesus taught was Torah. So these commandments that that Paul is referring to is the commandments of the law of God. For for you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification 
that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified, for God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Again, so far, so good. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, uh, who has given us the Holy Spirit. In the footnotes, uh, and you text reads, who also gives us the Holy Spirit. But, verse 9, but concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. Again, he's, he's referring to Torah, of course. And indeed, you do so toward all the brethren who are, who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you should increase more and more, that you will... Uh, that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with our own hands as we commanded you. That you may walk properly toward those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. Verse 13, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, which th this means died, basically, those who have died, lest you sorrow as others, as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Um, in the footnotes, excuse me here. In the footnotes, it's hard to read it here the way it is. Or those who sleep, or those who through Jesus sleep. So what does it mean to sleep in Jesus? In other words, uh, those who are, um, those who uh, pass away in their faith uh, in following Yeshua. Okay, so here's the kicker right here. Here's the kicker. For this we say to you, remember, remember this, this is Paul writing, Paul, Timothy, Silvanus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord that we, okay, we, um, this is certainly not, um, and Paul did not say those who are those who will live, uh, uh, you know, in the last day. You know, those who are, you know, the Lord showed me that you know it's going to be in the like how it says in the Book of Enoch. Basically, the Book of Enoch is like, well, this is not for you know it, today. This is for you know another time, um, not really today. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. So Paul is claiming that this is the word of the Lord now. Paul is claiming that he is speaking as a prophet, that he is speaking the word of the Lord. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive, we, who's we? Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. We who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. In other words, what we will not, um, we, well, I don't know how, it, we will not precede those who are asleep. We will not precede those who have passed away. Okay. In other words, those who pass away will be first, um, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, 
the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we, says Paul, who's we? Of course, again, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. We who are alive, and, and those whom he's writing to, by the way, as well, uh, he's, he's speaking as a group here. Those of you guys in Thessalonica right now, you know, me and Timothy and Paul, or me and Timothy and Silvanus and all you guys, we, we who are alive and remain, remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Okay, so here's the thing. That if what Paul was saying there is what it says, we, meaning Paul is speaking on behalf of himself and Timothy and Silvanus and those who, uh, his audience in Thessalonica, if that's what it, what it meant, if it meant what it actually says, then guess what? Paul was wrong. He was desperately wrong because he didn't just say it. He claimed that it was the word of the Lord speaking through him. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we, uh, I'm sorry, Paul, you got a little bit mixed up there. You, you, you missed it there, Paul. Okay. Because no, Paul, you did fall asleep with Timothy and Savannah, and everybody else that you wrote to. So none of you remained until the coming of the Lord. None of you. Although you, you said basically the all will. So, um, it's like, whoops, there's, um, you know, he made a mistake there. First uh, Thessalonians chapter 5. I, I, you know what? Some people, I know some people might say, well, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, when Paul said we, he was just talking about just like whoever uh, would be, you know, um, he wasn't really, he, he didn't really mean we, he just meant we as in whoever would be alive. But did he say that? I mean, that's the question. Did he say that? Is that the kind of impression that you get when you read that in context? Do you get the, the impression that he's talking about some future generation 2,000 some odd years after? Or do you get the impression that he's talking about himself, Tim, Timothy, Silvanus, and the brothers that he's speaking to? So again, in the beginning, it's like he's, he's like really looking forward to the second coming. It's like, you know, Jesus is coming back any time now. He's coming back any time now. He said it in chapter one, he said it in chapter two, he said it in chapter three, he said it in chapter four. So he didn't bother going into all this theology. You notice that, right? He didn't bo bother going into all the theology that he did in his other letters. He's just talking about, you know, just kind of like an exhortation kind of a letter. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter five, but concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night in the night. Again, the day of the Lord or the Lord's day is talking about the day of judgment here. Again, he's very apocalyptic here in what he's saying. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. So this is from the Tanakh, okay. But you, brethren are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. Okay, so in other words, this, this day will not come as like a thief in the night for you guys. You, you know better. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch over. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk in, uh, are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober. So he's using figurative speak here. He's not, um, he's not talking about literal night or literal day. Uh, he's talking about basically spiritual darkness and spiritual light. Okay, those, who are, those of us who are of the light, uh, the spiritual, spiritually speaking, uh, be sober 
putting on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation for God did not appoint to us wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you are also you also are doing. And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and and esteem them very highly in in love for their work's sake, be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone. But always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. You know, some I know some people say, you know, especially uh, you got people bragging about the uh, you know, bragging against the the Christians. I've heard people say, "Well, Christians only only pray once a week, you know, on Sunday." Well, we pray five times a day. Well. If Christians really go by what Paul said here, they'll be they'll never stop praying. Pray without ceasing. Not once or twice a day or three, four or five times a day, but without ceasing. In everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. It's good. Test all things. That's what we do here. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming, again, He's every chapter he's talking about this, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful who also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. You know, it just reminds me. Years ago, I used to work with this with this guy. And he always tried to get something on me. He always tried, he always tried to, 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 to dig up some dirt on me, this guy. And he was a Christian, okay? At least he claimed to be. Right, and like, like for example, uh, um, any little thing, he he was picking, just picking, nit, nitpicking on things, and so um, several times, because he he would be the type of guy that he'd be like, "Well, it says you know in 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 the Bible to do this, and you're not doing that, you know, you're not a Christian, you're not, you know, you're 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 you're, you're not really a believer, you." You know, you're a hypocrite. He would call me all kinds of things. So, you know, you'd say, you'd always pull out script. You'd always pull these, these verses, you know. And so, um, and so I would tease him and I'd say, well, it says, in, it says in the Bible to greet your brethren with a holy kiss. Here, give me one right now. Give me one right now. It says, greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. Come on, right now. I'm waiting. Never, ever did. I worked with this guy for years. Never, ever did that. Never, ever did. Uh, yeah, so just reminded me when I when I read this. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren. And you text omits holy. Interesting. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. So that is concludes our reading for tonight and that also concludes our reading of first Thessalonians interesting read uh, you'll notice over the over the period of time as we go through Paul's letters you'll notice how he evolves he you know again here you can see it very clearly he doesn't talk about theology much right he doesn't talk about 
oh, you know, about grace and faith and the law and, you know, uh, the works, you know, works the law, you know, and all that kind of stuff, like he does in Galatians and Romans and Corinthians. Um, he's just talking like it's a, it's a letter about exaltation and an, an apocalyptic letter always talking about Jesus coming. You better be ready any minute now. After a period of time, it seems like he kind of gives up on that. We see that through the, you know, in chronological order as he writes uh, his his letters. Okay, so having said that, that's it for our scripture reading. I'm going to get into some of the questions here. If you have any questions, please drop it in the live chat. I'll get to them. Alan says, shalom, everyone. Just got home. Shalom. Good to see you. And those awaiting the resurrection, the first resurrection, the, uh, the, yep, this is Paul's referring to. Billy says, I just learned of the epistle of Peter to James uh, in the Clementine homilies. It is a letter where Peter tells James of his concern that his teachings might be corrupted by the man who is my enemy thought to be Paul. Interesting read. Yes, it is. Absolutely. Actually, I've uh, referred to this um I've referred to the Clementine homilies uh, several times in the past several months. Uh, homily 11, chapter 35, very interesting read. Homily 11, chapter 35. Um, yes. Uh, Ferdinand Christian Bauer, otherwise known as F.C. Bauer, uh, in an old, uh, I believe it's a German uh, Bible scholar, a uh, very highly esteemed Bible scholar. Uh, he wrote. Uh, a, he wrote about the Clementine homilies. Perhaps you know we'll get into that sometime. We'll get into that kind of thing. He wrote about the Clementine homilies and how he believes that Simon Magus, uh, in the Clementine homilies and also referred to in the Book of Acts, was actually an alias for Paul. Very interesting. And in how Peter uh, and Paul never did really get along. Uh, to say the least. So yeah, it is a very interesting read, definitely worth studying for sure. Thank you for bringing that to our attention there, Billy. Okay. Um, last call for questions. Um, in the meantime, uh, let me just see here. For those of you who don't know, I, I was actually, I uh, we spoke about, they haven't spoken about this for the past several days, but uh, there is... Uh, let me just pull it up here. There is a link for those of you who might be interested in this. Um, there is a link for some T-shirts and other uh, other items. Uh, let me just pull this up here. Uh, this is a link in in the uh, in the description for t shirts. I serve the God of Intelligence. Uh, all kinds of t shirts, hoodies, even for babies. Uh, some organic uh, materials as well. There, love God, study Scripture. Uh, love God, study Scripture mug. Okay, uh, caps and uh, all kinds of different stuff like here. Think for yourself. Think for yourself. T shirts. Um, this kind of stuff, great things to wear uh, to uh, spark a conversation with um, with perhaps uh, some of your friends, co-workers, families, acquaintance, acquaintances, uh, or anything like that. Righteous reasoning rules the passions from four Maccabees. Very powerful uh, lesson there. Again, the mug, uh, righteous reasoning rules the passions. You can choose the color of the mug, a black handle, red handle, and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, Bags. Anyway, so we got lots of stuff like this. Um, the repentance sign as well. For if you want to be a little bit more, not so, uh, you know, uh, you don't want to have that, 
you don't want to have words. You just want to have symbols on your, uh, you know, on you. It's a repentance. You got a cap. Um, I believe there's a mug available in that as well. I, I'm not sure why it's not visible here, but the Bible is unbiblical. All this stuff is available um, for those of you who are interested in that. And so the link is in the description. All right, see what else we have here. Yeah, this is a good point, uh, Alan. If you read Paul and believe he taught against Torah, don't listen to Paul. Deuteronomy 13. Excellent. Absolutely, 100%. Absolutely. You know, people say all the time, do you throw Paul out? Do you, do, you, do you accept Paul? Do you accept Paul? It's like, what is this? Some kind of a Paul cult? It's like you got to go forward and, and accept Paul is, is what? Like, what, what do you mean accept Paul? I, you know, Paul is Paul. Paul is... What can I say? Paul is Paul. Uh, he's a, he's another man. Um, so yeah, and that, it it depends on how you read him. Most most people read him to to say that you know that 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 we are not to go by the Torah, and if that's the case, um, definitely yeah, we don't we do not. Uh, uh, we do not uh, listen to anybody who says not to go against the Torah, all right? So uh, as it says in Deuteronomy chapter 13, especially verses 1 through 5, absolutely. There are some people, the very small minority of people, who uh, believe that Paul taught Torah all the way through the scriptures. And that's kind of a, you know, a controversial topic. So Billy says, do you believe... Do you think the book of James is an argument against the teachings of Paul? It seems to be. I can't say certainly, but it seems to be. And I'll show you why. Um, yeah, let me just show you why. why. Why I would say that. Um, how am I going to do this? If you put them up side by side, you put them up side by side, which I'm just going to do here in just a second. Um, so, all right. I'll show you what I got here. Quick little. I'm just, I got two, uh, two windows open here side by side. I'm going to pull up. Um, well, I'm going to pull up Galatians chapter two on one. Galatians chapter two. And on the other one, uh, James chapter two. Okay, so um, actually, you know, I, I believe I should have Galatians chapter three up here. Yeah. So notice that it's very similar. Uh, Galatians 3 to James chapter 2. Uh, Paul starts out by saying, Oh, foolish Galatians. Whereas James uses similar uh, language. Okay. Um, oh, foolish man. Do you want evidence that faith without works or deeds is worthless? Okay. So Paul's like, oh, foolish Galatians, you know, who has bewitched you that, you know, basically it's just faith alone, basically is what how most people interpret this to say. Are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit, and now you're being made perfect by the flesh? And, and uh, you know, James is like, you foolish man. Uh, you know, don't you know that faith without deeds is dead? And he goes into, okay, so uh, Paul over here in Galatians chapter 3, he 
references Abra- uh, Galatians, or no, excuse me, not Galatians, Genesis, where it says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for, uh, for righteousness. And look at this. Down here, James used the same verse, the same verse, the exact same verse. What are the chances? What are the chances? Uh, that that they're they're speaking the same way, they're using the same verse, but coming to the opposite conclusions. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, it seems to be that James is refuting Paul. If the epistle of James is what a lot of people believe it to be, that is James, the uh, actually the writings of James the Just, um, then. James, the epistle, uh, uh, the epistle of James would be much more authoritative than than Paul. He always had the the final say. James did. Acts chapter fifteen, Acts chapter twenty one. Again, we read in in uh, Gospel of Thomas chapter twelve. James was the man. He was the man who was in charge of all of them. Um, Hegesippus says that too. Uh, Clementine homilies again homily eleven. Uh, chapter 35, if my memory serves me correctly. There's so many different sources that tell us that James had had all the authority. And I, actually, in the Clementine homilies, it says uh, uh, that uh, basically yeah, Peter said, if, uh, if, if anybody uh, teaches you anything, if it does not, uh, if it's not compatible with the teachings of James, Throw it out, basically. Um, some, I mean, just summarized. Um, but I, I've read that several times in the past several months. But uh, yeah, absolutely. I think that it is a good possibility for sure. Excellent question, Billy. Thank you. As always, we have the you know, excellent advice. Repent, follow Yeshua, keep Yahweh's commandments, and prepare your hearts. Absolutely. Paul Colt. Yes, Pamela. Yes, Paul Colt. Yeah, how many times do I get this, right? I, I get people asking me this all the time. Do you accept Paul? I'm like, what do you mean accept Paul? Like, is it some kind of Paul cult? You get, you go forward and you, it's like, you must, you must go through the Paul ritual. Did you, ex- did you accept Paul? Did he accept Paul? Oh, he didn't accept Paul. Oh man, that's it. He's he's out. That's it. Excommunicated. Okay. If he didn't, if he didn't say, if he didn't accept Paul, he's excommunicated. Yes, uh, Alan. I I don't follow Paul. I, I don't follow any man. I follow Yeshua. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, great deception. Alan says, my prayer for uh, for more than 30 years has been, Father, let me be more like Yeshua in whom you are well pleased. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it really makes me wonder because there are so many people who say, what would Jesus do? Or let's be more Christ-like. Yeah, let's be more like Jesus. But then when you say, okay, let's obey the Torah. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh no, we don't obey the Torah. Okay, that that's for the Jews. That's not for us. Well, what would Jesus do? You know, what would Jesus do? For sure, he'd obey the Torah. He'd obey the commandments for sure. So the more you obey the commandments, the more Christ-like you become. Right? The more you the more you you follow the the instructions of the Torah, the more you become like Yeshua. Amen. All right, guys. So that's uh, that's it for tonight. And uh, yeah, so tomorrow we'll, we'll continue reading through uh, the epistles of Paul. Again, we're reading in a roughly chronological order. I say roughly because sometimes it's kind of hard to put it in exactly the chronological order, especially when you have a lot of uh, scholars who disagree on certain certain things. But we will get to uh, we will get to them in a roughly chronological order. Uh, you know, I in all the years I've been to church. 
in all the years I've been a Christian, I don't know. I don't know if even anybody has even, uh, I don't know if anybody who has actually read the New Testament in this way. Like, okay, so this book was written first. Let's read that first. Yeah. Kind of brings, you know, brings, it brings light on, on the theology of, you know, especially once we get to the Gospel of John again, because the Gospel of John is so late. There's a lot of, you know, and scholars, I know some scholars would say this as well. There's a lot of Pauline theology that that is in the Gospel of John, and the Gospel of John was influenced heavily by Paul. So, yeah, interesting to see this. So, thanks again, everyone. You guys are awesome. Appreciate each and every one of you. Love you guys. You guys are world changers. Thank you for your questions and your comments. WWJD, he kept the Father's commands. Amen. Alan says, thank you, brother. Much love and blessings to you all. Thank you, Alan. Much love and blessings multiplied to you, brother. And Billy says, thank you all. Shalom and good night. Thank you, Billy. Shalom. Good night. Blessings, blessings. Tammy says, have a wonderful night, all. I had a new audience today listening. Awesome. Awesome. Well, blessings to you and your new audience. Blessings in abundance. I pray that everything that we shared tonight would would uh, would bear much fruit in your life and uh, would bless you as much as it has blessed me. All this information uh, has blessed me, and so I just want to bless you guys, and, and hopefully uh, God... Uh, uses it to increase your knowledge in the scriptures and in heaven and the things of God and, and, you know, in increasing and benefiting your relationship with God. So blessings guys. Vinny says, thank you, Christopher. Many blessings to everyone. Shalom. Thank you, Vinny. Many blessings multiplied back to you, brother. I appreciate you. Okay, guys, I will see you tomorrow night. Lord willing, same time, same place. Picking up again with the epistles of Paul. As always, I pray the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you, lift up his countenance upon you, and give you wonderful, wonderful shalom. Amen, amen. See you tomorrow.